Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chan, for the introduction. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm Bernie. I'm one of the C1s. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, the role of pulmonary air, sorry, echocardiography and pulmonary air, uh, hypertension. Uh, some of my goals for today. Uh, for, for the first part, I'm going to talk a little bit about the hemodynamic and pathophysiologic classifications of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, then I want to go into some of the guideline recommended applications of echo when assessing pH. Uh, thirdly, uh, I want to talk about some of the advantages and limitations to uh, each of these methods of, of assessment. And uh, finally, uh, provide a framework for uh, how to approach uh, screening, uh, assessing etiology, and assessing severity of pulmonary hypertension by ECHO. Uh, in terms of my outline, I'll start off by going through the different uh, classifications uh, in pulmonary hypertension, and then uh, we'll go one by one through screening, uh, etiology, uh, severity and prognosis and go through some of the guidelines, uh, methods, uh, advantages and limitations of each of those. Uh, so the, the classification uh, of the pulmonary hypertension uh, from a hemodynamic standpoint was last updated in uh, 2018 at the World Symposium on Pulmonary Hypertension. Uh, and at that time, the uh, cutoffs for uh, diagnosing pulmonary hypertension were updated. Uh, in terms of uh, specifically the mean pulmonary arterial pressure. So uh, in all forms of pulmonary hypertension uh, now, the uh, cutoff uh, for uh, a mean pulmonary arterial pressure uh, is, is greater than 20. Um, and then in order to fit into one of these other categories, it's based on uh, your either your wedge pressure or your PVR or both. Um, so in a typical pre-capillary uh, hemodynamic profile, um, you're gonna see uh, a wedge pressure less than 15 and uh, pulmonary vascular resistance uh, greater than or equal to three woods units. In a post capillary profile, um, you're going to see the typical uh, mean pulmonary arterial pressure greater than 20, uh, but you're going to see a wedge over 15 and uh, you're going to see a PVR less than three. In a combined uh, hemodynamic profile, combined pre and post, you're going to see a, again a mean pulmonary arterial pressure over 20 and a wedge over 15 uh, and a PVR greater than or equal to three uh, woods units. So the other way to classify pulmonary hypertension is um, by the uh, underlying pathophysiologic condition. Um, and so this is uh, through the World Health Organization groups. And so uh, the WHO group one uh, refers to a pulmonary arterial hypertension or idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, which uh, has a uh, pre-capillary hemodynamic profile. Type 2 uh, is pulmonary hypertension due to any uh, left-sided heart disease, systolic dysfunction, diastolic dysfunction, just got dark in here, um, uh, valvular disease, um, and, uh, and, and uh, that's to start. And in, in a type 2 pulmonary hypertension, you can have either a post-capillary uh, hemodynamic profile, which is typically what you think of when you think of uh, pH due to left-sided heart disease. But as this uh, process becomes more chronic, uh, due to a mechanism that, that's not fully understood, uh, but one proposed mechanism is from uh, basically chronic hypoxia and vasoconstriction, is that uh, over time you have um, a increase in the vasoreactivity in your pulmonary vascular bed, and you do see actually a combined hemodynamic profile in uh, type 2 uh, pH. Uh, in, in type 3 uh, pH, which is uh, due to uh, lung disease, hypoxia, or both, uh, this is typically a pre-capillary hemodynamic profile. Uh, and in type 4, uh, which is chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, it's uh, also a pre-capillary hemodynamic profile. Type 5 is a mixed bag with multiple different underlying etiologies that I'm not going to focus on for the purpose of this presentation, but uh, it can present with any of the hemodynamic profiles, pre, post, or, or com uh, combined. Uh, so this is a, just a slide just to show you how uh, complicated and uh, how many different subcategories of um, etiologies there can be within each section, uh, but I won't go into all of that. And this slide is a little bit about the epidemiology of pulmonary hypertension. And um, uh, as you can see, pulmonary hypertension is largely a disease of the, of, of, of the left side of the heart. Uh, about 70% of uh, cases diagnosed um, 
uh, pulmonary hypertension cases that are diagnosed are, are type 2, uh, and with the remaining uh, about 30% comprised of, of the others, uh, with 15% of the bulk of the, the remaining being made up of type 5. Uh, and for me, surprisingly, only 9% uh, being due to a chronic lung disease and hypoxia, and uh, only uh, about 3% of all uh, diagnosed cases of pulmonary hypertension are uh, a true type 1 pulmonary uh, arterial hypertension. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, screening in uh, the role of echocardiography and pulmonary hypertension. and um, and how we uh, can approach screening. And so uh, different societies have different statements, but I, I like this statement it's from the ESC. Uh, and just as a, a note, uh, I, I used the most recent guidelines uh, and position statements for this talk. And so it's mainly from the ESC and ERS uh, 2015 uh, guidelines on the diagnosis management of pulmonary hypertension and the CCS and CTS uh, uh, position statement on the diagnosis management of, of pH in 2020. Uh, HA and ACC haven't released an updated uh, guideline since 2009, so I didn't focus on them quite as much. Uh, so um, the, the goal, uh, goals of screening and echocardiography are to essentially establish the probability of pulmonary hypertension based on according to ESC, uh, tricuspid regurgitant velocity, as well as additional signs suggestive of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, some uh, general, uh, general recommendations is that all patients with clinically suspected pulmonary hypertension should undergo a TTE. And then another caveat is that when treatment of pulmonary hypertension itself is being considered, uh, echo alone is not sufficient to support any treatment decisions and uh, a right heart cath is required. Uh, so here is a uh, just a very brief uh, case. Uh, so as an example, it's a referral for a TTE uh, with a, a 45 year old uh, with a, a female with past medical history of scleroderma, with uh, vague uh, sort of dyspnea on exertion, and the request is for, to evaluate for pul pulmonary hypertension. An echo is done, which shows a TRV max of two meters per second, and there's no pulmonic stenosis noted, and there's just mild TR. And the question is, uh, what is the probability of pulmonary hypertension just based on this information? Is it low, intermediate, high, or insufficient information to determine? And so I will get into this. Uh, okay, so uh, this is basically a, a, an approach to using uh, TRV to uh, guide uh, establishing or proposing of the probability of pulmonary hypertension um, uh, in, your, in your ECHO report. Um, and uh, so um, the ESC suggests that it can be broken down into uh, several cutoffs. Uh, and so they, they break it down into uh, less than 2.8 meters per second, 2.9 to 3.4, and over 3.4 meters per second. Uh, and then they factor in uh, it, whether or not there's uh, other echo signs of pH um, present, and then based on that composite, they determine what the echocardiographic probability of pH is. And so, uh, if it's uh, if the TRV is less than 2.8, uh, and there's no other uh, echo signs of pH, then the uh, echo probability is low. Uh, if it's less than 2.8 or not measurable, but there are um, echo signs of pulmonary hypertension, then uh, the probability is intermediate. If it's 2.9 to 3.4 without uh, echo signs of pH, then it's again intermediate. If uh, the, it's 2.9 to 3.4 with echo signs of pH, then it's high. And if it's over 3.4 without, uh, there's no need to evaluate other signs of um, pulmonary hypertension and the pr uh, probability is high. Uh, and so, uh, just kind of going back to, uh, you know, what, what exactly do they mean by other echo signs of pH? Uh, do, are they referring to something specifically? And, and they are. Um, and so this is the way that they uh, break it down. Uh, so they break it down anatom anatomically into three categories, uh, the ventricles, pulmonary artery, 
uh, IBC and uh, right atrium, A, B, and C. And uh, in order to uh, take a yes on that second column and say that there are other features of pulmonary hypertension, you need at least one um, from two separate categories. Um, and so uh, within uh, the ventricles, the um, what they suggest is important to evaluate is the right ventricle to left ventricle basal diameter ratio. And if it's greater than one, then that suggests pulmonary hypertension. Uh, if there's flattening of the interventricular sep uh, septum, specifically uh, if uh, you look at the eccentricity index and it's uh, greater than 1.1 in systole and or diastole. Uh, and then, uh, so that's the ventricles. For when looking at the pulmonary artery, um, a lot of these metrics are looking at markers of increased uh, PA pressures and they look for things like uh, right ventricular flow and acceleration time uh, less than 105. Uh, and or uh, mid-systolic notching. They also suggest looking at that early diastolic pulmonic, uh, pulmonary regurgitation velocity uh, with a cutoff of 2.2 meters per second as uh, being suggested. And then they also look at the uh, size of the PA and um, suggest that, that a PA diameter over 25 millimeters is, is also suggestive. When looking at the IBC in the right atrium, uh, they do a, the standard IBC assessment that, uh, um, that we we go through when we're uh, looking at echo and uh and then they also suggest looking at the uh, right atrial area at a during during systole and if it's greater than 18 centimeters squared then um then you would uh, fill that category so what do we do once we've gone through these two steps uh and how can we direct clinicians further as to whether or not you know a right heart cath might be a reasonable next step and so the ESC also includes this in, in this sort of uh, algorithm and, and they suggest uh, that once you've established a probability and if that probability is low intermediate or high then you look at some of the other risk factors that the patient has clinically and uh, then you can determine uh, recommendations or next steps and so uh, I'll just take a moment to go through that. So if you have gone through the echo and you've established a low probability of uh, pH and there's no risk factors, then there's a class 2A recommendation uh, with level C evidence that uh, an alternative diagnosis should be considered. And if there are risk factors, then you can consider echo follow-up, though this is non-specific and they don't give any sort of uh, interval um, recommendations. If you've established an intermediate probability of echo, then um, and there are no risk factors uh, clinically, then uh, you can, this is also very nonspecific, they say an alternative diagnosis, echo follow-up, it can be considered, or you can consider further invest investigation of pulmonary hypertension. So that's not very helpful. But um, if they're intermediate probability and there uh, are risk factors, then they do suggest uh, with the level B evidence as class 2A recommendation that uh, right heart cath should be considered. And then uh, stronger evidence uh, or stronger recommendations. Sorry. Uh, if you've established a high uh, probability based on echo of pH, uh, then without risk factors, uh, then right heart cath is recommended with risk factors and right heart cath is recommended. Uh, so here is a, a, some, a statement by the CCS, which is in contrast to some of the, the ESC guidelines, which uh, pretty much suggests doing same thing in terms of the um, variables that you uh, assess on echo but they do uh, instead of saying um, that they uh, would look at the TRV specifically they they suggest looking at an estimation of SPAC. Yeah. okay and so for this question uh, the answer is that you have insufficient information to determine because you don't know what any of the other features are uh, and, uh, and so you can't determine a probability of pulmonary hypertension just based on a, a low TRV max uh, velocity. And so uh, that leads me to the first uh, topic, which is uh, a TRV and estimated uh, pul pulmonary, arter pulmonary arterial systolic pressure, uh, which in most echo labs is the initial screening measure for pH, and it's obtained by uh, uh, using a CW through the tricuspid valve and uh, looking for the max velocity. And then from there, 
you can uh, determine that PASP, once you uh, examine the IVC, using the uh, modified Bernoulli equation, uh, so four times the peak TRV squared plus right atrial pressure. Uh, there are some uh, notable limitations uh, for this um, this method. Uh, it's not reliable when there's pulmonary stenosis or when there's uh, RVOT obstruction. Uh, as your PA pressures are going to be um, overestimated. Um, in the setting of severe TR, um, you're going to have an underestimation of your PA pressures. And the reason for that is that you're going to be most likely underestimating your right atrial pressure based on your IBC assessment. The, high, the highest that it goes to is 15. And so um, that you can, it's likely that you're underestimating. Um, or another reason is that uh, you have uh, early equalization of the pressures between your RV and your RA. And so that reduces the, uh, the pressure gradient and the velocity. And that, that leads to lower velocities and under, underestimation as well. Another thing to consider is that the accuracy of these measurements is debated um, uh, in terms of uh, studies that have looked at uh, the correlation of uh, TRV, or sorry, P estimated PASP to right heart cath measurements of PASP, and I'll go into a little bit of the literature there. Um, some more uh, some technical considerations is that it's very important when uh, getting a CW through the tricuspid valve to get a uh, an envelope to try and get the densest envelope possible and doing this from uh, multiple views and uh, sometimes these views have been modified uh, apical views or low uh, RV uh, inflow views and so uh, taking the time to do that is important um, also um, there is uh, some data that suggests that if uh, you have an incomplete uh, spectral wave envelope that uh, use of contrast agents is, uh, is helpful and can improve the accuracy of your measurements. But just as not having, uh, just as underestimating your, your TRV without using contrast in the setting of an incomplete uh, spectral wave uh, envelope, there's also the possibility of giving contrast and then overestimating it because you're just measuring a fringe artifact and uh, this is an example from the, the Jace Right Heart Assessment Guidelines, and you can see on the left is uh, the, it's from the same patient. Um, they take the, uh, the tricuspid bridge velocity and they measure the, you can see kind of the envelope here. And then when you add contrast, uh, although this seems almost intentionally overestimated, but they, they measure it here uh, you know, at the fringe. And so you have to be careful when using contrast as it can uh, can add quite a bit. And then when factoring in the, the equation for in the modified Bernoulli and uh, that it's a 4V squared, uh, small differences in your velocity can be uh, amplified in your final estimation of pressure. Okay, and so just spending a little bit of time uh, looking at the accuracy of the, this measurement. Uh, so uh, this is a paper uh, from Fisher uh, at, and and colleagues, which was out of Johns Hopkins, which was done in 2009, and um, very briefly, it was a prospective study, a single center, and uh, they did a Doppler echo uh, within one hour of right heart cath, and uh, they found that uh, the correlation code, it was at end of 65, and the correlation coefficient was 0.66, uh, but they found that uh, only 48% of echo drive PASPs were within 10 millimeters of mercury of the values that they, they found during right heart cath. This prompted some more research in the same kind of topic. And uh, so this is a paper out of University of Chicago by Rich and Gallit uh, who did a similar thing. Unfortunately, the echo and the right heart cath aren't quite as closely uh, uh, done together. But it's within 30 days. That's a little bit larger of a sample size with 160 patients. They found a very similar correlation coefficient and very similar um, findings in terms of accuracy, where only 49% of echo-derived uh, PASP estimates were uh, within 10 millimeters uh, of mercury. This prompted more discussion and uh, a larger uh, analysis of the it's a single this issue. And so this was uh, the biggest one to do it. And so this is Center of Retrospectomy. 
and um, they uh, have a right heart cath neck performed within five days of one another. And there's 1,700 patients included in this one. And they using a systolic pulmonary arterial pressure of 36. They found that the accuracy was quite good, uh, 85%, and that it had good sensitivity, specificity, and positive predictive value. Uh, the negative predictive value was only uh, 70%. In their discussion, they suggest that uh, you know, there are many technical limitations in uh, acquiring your TRV and to uh, make sure you optimize that. Um, so uh, we discussed some of those technical limitations already. So here's some of the relevant guideline statements. So the ESC does recommend against the use of PASB their uh, perceived inaccuracies in right atrial pressure estimation in favor of the use instead of TRV max. And uh, pH cannot be de reliably defined by a TRV cut off. Uh, another thing to consider is that uh, PASP and TRV is not a good determinant of prognosis or severity. I'll get more into prognosis and severity later, but um, since I'm talking about it now, uh, and the reason for this is that uh, in severe pulmonary hypertension, as the disease course progresses and you get uh, right, right ventricular uh, overload and failure, then uh, your cardiac output uh, goes down and uh, your PASP actually reaches a peak and then starts to go down as well as your RV is failing. So uh, using um, PASP as a surrogate for severity is not uh, reliable. Um, and then this, uh, I won't go into in too much detail, but just knowing that there are other uh, hemodynamic measurements uh, that you can get uh, by ECHO, uh, and you can use these to, to check your internal consistency to see if the, the measurements that you're getting in terms of your PASP uh, using TRV is, uh, it makes sense. Uh, alternatively, if you're not getting a good uh, tricuspid uh, regression, which happens commonly, then there are some of, uh, other ways to, uh, to, to provide some sort of estimated hemodynamics. And um, uh, here's, uh, here's a few of some of these do, um, but, uh, if you look at uh, the pulmonic regurgitant jet, that's one way. You can uh, estimate mean pulmonary arterial pressure using the Bernoulli equation by doing for uh, V peak uh, PR squared plus right atrial pressure. And then you can also estimate the uh, pulmonary artery diastolic pressure using the end uh, uh, PR velocity uh, and using the Bernoulli uh, equation there. And then there is a way to calculate uh, PVR, but it is not uh, very uh, reliable. This is a slide from the, the Mayo uh, Clinic Echo Board Review, and uh, they have a, a large cohort of patients that they've uh, done right heart casts on and compared uh, what they see on right heart cath to their echo findings. And here they um, they have uh, 500 patients about who re received right heart cath, and uh, they compared that to a uh, to how that correlated with two thirds of their estimated systolic pulmonary arterial pressure. And it seemed to have a very good correlation coefficient of 0.96 with a P of less than 0.001. And so that's uh, just a, a nice, quick, easy way if you have a, a good uh, estimated PASP to, to um, have a sense of what the, the mean pulmonary, pulmonary arterial pressure might be. Uh, okay, so uh, now I'll spend a bit of time uh, going into the, the next part, which is uh, the other signs that I mentioned. Um, okay, so I'll spend some time going through the, the, the ventricles here. And so the eccentricity index is the first uh, part of this. And um, so what it is, is it's a ratio of the axis, which is uh, parallel to the septum, uh, over, which is D2. And that would be this line right here over uh, the ratio of the, uh, sorry, the length of the axis uh, perpendicular to the septum, which is here. So D2 over D1 will give you your eccentricity index. Uh, and so here's a, a picture of you know a normal on the top. Uh, this although this is taken from a pediatric patient, so that's why the cavity size looks small. Um, but it's the same concept. And so here in the bottom is an uh, example with um, of a patient with pulmonary hypertension who clearly has a, a large um, or an elevated eccentricity index. This is at end diastole, and the eccentricity index is 1.79, and this is at the end systole, and the eccentricity index is about uh, three. And 
So that's just in terms of technical considerations, the measurements should be done between the level of the papillary muscles and the mitral valve. And it's usually done, as I mentioned, in diastole and systole. And uh, trying your best to avoid off-axis images makes this measurement more uh, reliable. Uh, if the ESC defines an eccentricity uh, over 1.1, is that normal? And uh, as uh, we've traditionally been ta uh, taught, eccentricity only in diastole um, suggests volume overload. Eccentricity in systole suggests uh, pressure overload. And again, uh, even though we're in the screening section, uh, since I'm talking about eccentricity, it actually does have some prognostic value. Uh, and there has been several, and it's recommended as being utilized in that fashion by ESC and CCS. Uh, and so there's been several studies, one of which I included here. It's a retrospective study done by Gio et al. with uh, 56 patients who were diagnosed with pulmonary arterial hypertension and followed for 52 months. And in their study in EI and diastole of over uh, 1.7 predicted mortality with a hazard ratio of 3.68. Uh, okay, and so the next uh, measurement is the RV-LV uh, basal diameter ratio, and it is exactly what it sounds like, which is just uh, at end diastole you measure the, the basal diameter of the RV and LV, you take the ratio. Uh, anything over one uh, is uh, suggests RV dilatation. This is a nice slide I liked uh, from the Mayo Echo uh, board review, and it just gives you a quick, uh, easy way to get a sense of how enlarged the RV is. And so uh, on the left, uh, this is a, a normal uh, apical four, where the right ventricle is approximately two-thirds the size of the left ventricle. Then you can start to see some mild uh, right ventricular enlargement as the um, the septum starts going more towards the apex, and it looks like the right ventricle and left ventricle are starting to share the apex. And then qualitatively, you can look, and once the right ventricle is larger than the left ventricle, then you can see moderate right ventricular enlargement. And then once it starts to see an extremely large right ventricle with a D-shaped septum, then you start to get classified as a severe uh, right ventricular enlargement. Okay, and that's so moving on to the pulmonary artery uh, measurements. Uh, so, uh, looking at the features of increased pulmonary arterial pressure, uh, so the first is the RVOT acceleration time, and the idea is that in the setting of increased pulmonary arterial pressures, that uh, your RVOT uh, acceleration time is going to be short, uh, and this makes sense uh, clinically. You have an early closure of your pulmonic valve, uh, high PA pressures, and you have to create greater uh, a greater amount of pressure in order to, uh, to check. And so uh, the ESC suggests a, a time uh, less than 105 uh, milliseconds is indicative of pulmonary hypertension. Another uh, metric that you can look at is notching uh, or the W sign. And, and sorry, both of these are obtained by doing a pulse wave uh, right at the level of the pulmonic valve, uh, usually in the short axis. Um, and so uh, the idea here with notching, which you can see uh, here, is uh, that in the setting of uh, typically pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension, when you see this feature, it can help kind of suggest that the hemodynamic uh, classification is more likely to be pre-capillary, is that uh, when the, because of the increased stiffness of the arterial walls in the pulmonary vascular bed, that you get uh, reverberant waves during systole uh, backwards, uh, and so that results in this kind of notch. Um, Okay, and so then uh, another one, and the last one I'll talk about uh, for this part is uh, the early diastolic pulmonic regurgitant velocity. Uh, and so this can be used uh, sometimes as a surrogate uh, for pulmonary pressures when you don't have a TRV. And uh, similarly, it's a, sh uh, a short axis, um, uh, but this is a CW uh, through the pulmonic valve, and uh, you take the uh, basically the peak uh, velocity uh, in during uh, pulmonic regurgitation. And uh, anything over 2.2 is considered as a, is supposed to be a marker of elevated uh, mean pulmonary arterial pressure. Um, so the uh, next uh, part is the pulmonary artery diameter. Uh, and so typically this is a short axis, it's taken in a short axis view between the level of the pulmonic valve and the bifurcation of the PA. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's defined anything greater than 25 millimeters is just, uh, defined as uh, enlarged. 
And here's an example of a very enlarged PA, 81 millimeters uh, in a patient with uh, KH. Okay, and then also the last section, IVC and right atrium. Since uh, we do IVC daily, I'm not gonna go into that. Uh, and just quickly talk about the right atrial area. And it uh, is what it sounds like. You take, uh, using planimetry and ventricular, ventricular systole, you take the right atrial area and anything over 18 centimeters squared is considered abnormal. Okay, so that's uh, kind of the approach to screening, uh, the key uh, views and measurements you want to obtain. And so next I'll talk about the etiology and hemodynamic classifications. And so when thinking about uh, etiology, ECHO's main uh, use and being helpful is distinguishing between uh, pre and post capillary, not really identifying the specific pathophysiologic mechanism for uh, for it. Um, and so in uh, pre-capillary features, we kind of discussed uh, earlier uh, in terms of the RVOT notching, but also when you see a severely dilated and remodeled right ventricle, you want to start thinking that it might be pre-capillary. And also just worth noting, as, as mentioned before, that type 1, 3, and 4 are distinguishable by, by echo. Some features that are strongly predictive of, um, of post-capillary pH are systolic or diastolic dysfunction, LVH, left-sided valvular disease, or the LAPI, uh, enlarged uh, left atrial volume, index left, uh, left atrial volume. Um, and so this, this is getting more into uh, looking at the actual underlying uh, pathophysiologic etiology and when you should be looking for shunts. And so the CCS uh, position statement in 2020 suggests that agitated saline, uh, or TEE, uh, routinely uh, in the setting of enlarged right heart chambers or sus suspected significant pH. The ESC uh, takes us a little bit farther and, and they suggest that when you see high pulmonary blood flow on pulse wave Doppler and you don't, uh, in the absence of a de detectable shunt or you have significant dilatation of your proximal PA with only moderate uh, pH, then they suggest either a TE with contrast or a CMR to exclude uh, sinus venosus atrial septal defect and or anomalous pulmonary venous return. And so this is an example of a sinus venosus defect. Uh, so it's a partial anomalous pul uh, pulmonary venous return. And so this is the right pulmonary vein. I'm not sure if it's superior or inferior, but there is clearly a defect in the RPV and the SVC. And you can see some flow going uh, from left to right. That's right, it's a TE. Okay, and so the uh, the last section is uh, discussing severity and uh, prognostication. Um, and so uh, some of the most important predictors of prognosis and severity by echo are looking at uh, pericardial effusion, uh, the presence of it, uh, the indexed right atrial area, uh, RV dimensions, and then RV systolic function, which is a difficult topic. And, uh, this review, it, it's broken down into looking at systolic function, either in the basal function measures, global function measures, or regional function measures. The basal function measures are also regional function measures, but they're just at the, at the base of the heart. And so the, the basal function measures are TAPC or S prime. Global function measures are RV fractional area change or uh, myocardial performance index. Uh, and regional function, uh, one that I'll mention is the uh, free wall longitudinal strain 2D speckle track. And so the ones that, are, that I bolded are the ones that I'll kind of focus on. Uh, other important predictors of uh, prognosis and severity are uh, looking at uh, the severity of TR and eccentricity index, as we discussed before. So uh, here's an example of a patient with severe pulmonary hypertension, and uh, we can tell that based on several things just immediately. Uh, we can say that the Right ventricle is severely enlarged. You can start to see a, a D shaped septum already. You can see the RV is significantly larger than the LV. You can see a severe right atrial enlargement. And uh, you can see underfilling of the left side of the heart. Uh, also, of note, there's a pericardial effusion. And so, when you see a pericardial effusion, what uh, information can you say about prognosis? And, uh, and so, just very quickly, the mechanism uh, is not clearly understood, but it's thought to be secondary to extremely elevated RA pressures. And uh, basically, the effect on that, on the uh, venous and lymphatic drainage of pericardial fluid and gradual accumulation uh, that way. And so 
Uh, when looking and thinking about prognostication, uh, there's been several studies. Uh, just, I just mentioned two here. Uh, one was done by the Hendra Litter et al. And they said that they looked at uh, 79 patients with severe pulmonary arterial hypertension. It was a retrospective study, and it uh, suggested a threefold increase in one year mortality in patients with even a small uh, to moderate pericardial effusion. And then uh, the next one done by Raymond et al. and the citations in the end is uh, they looked at an, uh, an N of 81 from pulmonary arterial hypertension. This is perspective, and they found a hazard ratio for death at one year of 3.89, uh, which is quite statistically significant. Um, and then another interesting thing to think about is uh, in pulmonary hypertension patients that the, the right sided chambers might be the higher pressure chambers and in the setting of tamponade you may see your left-sided chambers uh, be the first to collapse. Okay, uh, the RV dimensions, uh, it's seen with worsening pulmonary hypertension. Generally when measuring the dimensions you take a basal measurement, a basal RV diameter, a mid RV diameter, then an RV length, uh, and that is taken from the plane of the tricuspid annulus to the RV apex and uh, these are kind of the abnormals. So any basal RV diameter over 41 millimeters is suggested to be abnormal. Any mid RV diameter uh, uh, greater than 35 is suggested to be abnormal. And any RV length over 83 is suggested to be ab abnormal. It should be noted that this uh, is not uh, a perfect uh, way to measure it, uh, to measure the RV because it, it doesn't account for the RVOT, and uh, it likely results in not, you know underestimation of the RV size. Uh, and I know most of these right-sided measurements should be done in an, uh, in an apical, in a, when, when done in an apical four view, should be done with an RV focus view. And so moving on to the RV systolic function, uh, it's typically a, quite a difficult uh, metric to estimate due to several reasons. From an imaging standpoint, there's, the RV is a, a, a complicated shape, it's crescentic, crescentic. it's also retrosternal. And then when looking at the RV and echo, we don't have great endocardial definition either. Another reason it's uh, difficult is that the RV being more of a volume pump uh, has a lot of load dependence and that can alter many of the functional indices that you, you measure uh, with echo. So on a given day, based on volume status, you're gonna get a different measurement uh, for some of these indices. Uh, the last one to consider is that an RV compared to LV, uh, the part of predominant uh, way that it contracts is longitudinally uh, with only modest radial contraction. And there's been some echo studies which have tried to estimate how much is longitudinal, how much is radial, and one suggests that uh, the RV is it's, uh, comprised of 75% of, of longitudinal short. And so the ESC uh, has this statement which says that given the complex geometry of the right ventricle that no variable alone is sufficient to describe RV function and that the overall impression of an experienced echocardiographer is more important than single variables. So something to keep in mind. Um, uh, with that in mind, we'll start looking at uh, some regional measures, the basal measures. Uh, so we'll look at TAPSI first. And so this is obtained in apical four with an M mode along the lateral tricuspid annulus. Uh, ideally, you're using a fast sweep speed. And uh, there's been several validation studies for TAPSI over the years. And it's made its way to the guidelines. It's less than 1.7 centimeters uh, being highly suggestive of RV dysfunction. Uh, there, there have been some studies correlating TAPSI with radionuclide angiography, and they found a good uh, correlation as well uh, in terms of the RV uh, estimation of RV. Uh, there are many uh, important limitations or several important limitations of TAPSI and one being that it's very angle dependent and you have to be on axis with the motion of the tricuspid annulus in order to get uh, an accurate TAPSI and uh, it also is prone to translational error. So what does that mean uh, if you have a decreased RV systolic function, uh, basal systolic function and your but your left ventricular function is preserved, then you may see a swinging of the right ventricle as, uh, as the LV contracts. It's called translational error. One way to better assess whether this is translational error is to look at the RV apex. And if the apex is swinging, then that suggests that uh, it's likely, uh, or there may be some uh, translational error to, to factor in. And this is, uh, uh, in terms of some of these Another limitation, sorry, is that uh, it is just a basal fun regional measurement and that uh, if the 
underlying pathology with regional variability, like uh, in the setting of an RV infarct or pulmonary embolism, then this does not become a reliable measure of the overall systolic point of the, of the right ventricle. And on the right here, we see uh, you know, a normal tapsy and then a abnormal tapsy. Okay, the next uh, regional measure, which is uh, looking at very similar things to TAPSI, is the gas prime, uh, which is the uh, pulse wave tissue doppler to lateral tricuspid annulus, and uh, an S prime of less than 10 centimeters per second is uh, suggested for barbie dysfunction, but the same limitations as TAPSI in that it's added to can be point of translation for, and there are, uh, and that it's a regional measurement. Uh, okay, so then uh, the RV fractional area change is one way to, to try and estimate the RV systolic function and to measure the global systolic function. But the measurement for it is uh, to take the RV area at the end diastole minus RV area and systole and then divide that by the RV area uh, and diastole. Anything less than 35% is considered to be abnormal. Um, and again, we mentioned that the endocardium can be difficult to visualize, so this can result in you know, limitations to this method. And also, it doesn't um, contribute, uh, doesn't factor in the RBOT when thinking about the RB systolic function. Uh, okay, so uh, RB strain uh, is a little bit outside uh, the, the scope of this presentation, so but I am mentioning it because it's made its way into uh, some of the, the guidelines, and so. Just briefly say that so RV strain with 2D spectral tracking, uh, the way that it's acquired is usually a four chamber with an RV focused view, and then you use a 2D grayscale V mode and you ensure very high resolution images, and then you just track the, the motion of each of the speckles, uh, and from that derive uh, a systolic function based on how far those speckles move. Uh, the reason it's coming into uh, the guidelines and why people are favoring this is because it's an angle independent uh, measurement and less prone to translation or translational error. But well, some of the important limitations is that not every echo lab has this and has experience with it, and you do require very high, high resolution images to have good measurements. Uh, there's uh, quite a bit of um, evidence that suggests it's uh, highly prognostic and even superior to. Uh, uh, taps here. And so here is just a kind of an example or an image just showing somebody attempting uh, a RV strain, uh, speckle tracking. And uh, you can see kind of each segment here corresponding to each color here. And you can determine kind of the regional systolic function and map it out. And uh, yes. Um, okay, so the reason I, I brought up strain is because uh, the 2020 uh, CCS guidelines, uh, they, they go over what they recommend for uh, monitoring uh, pH patients and establishing severity and prognosis, and the markers that they suggest are the same as the ESU, which is the ones that I went through just now, uh, but they also mentioned that, uh, that they have, there's a strong recommendation for using free wall, free wall strain specifically. Uh, in uh, labs with suitable equipment and expertise when evaluating pulmonary hypertension patients. And so uh, I think I'm ending a little bit early, but uh, so some of the take home points are uh, that the goal of echocardiography and screening is to assign a probability of pulmonary hypertension and guide decisions regarding further diagnostic interventions. And in most cases, TRV and estimated PSB is insufficient love to determine the probability of pulmonary hypertension and routine acquisition of other addition, additional guideline directed echo features is recommended. Uh, ECMO, uh, provides important markers of severity and prognosis in pulmonary hypertension. And finally, that uh, right heart cath is still the gold standard when trying to evaluate hemodynamics, treatment response, diagnosis uh, in pulmonary hypertension. And so that's it. So thank you so much uh, for this very comprehensive review and uh, we appreciate it. And if you can send us um, the, um, some of the um, uh, guidelines that you have or link, and then you know, I can incorporate into the video, the recording. So that'll be very, very useful for reference. And uh, 
So the RV string is particularly interesting as a new um, new modality, and I'm so glad that you brought it up. And um, so should we do it routinely on every single one that has pulmonary hypertension? And uh, what what is the prognostic um, value of it? Should we follow it in the long term? Yeah. So I don't know that I have a, a perfect answer for you there, but. Uh, I know that uh, there have been some large recent meta-analyses that have been looking both at global strain and free wall strain and have found that there are specific cutoffs in terms of, sort of uh, strain metrics and uh, prognostication in patients with pulmonary hypertension. So once their strain drops less than, I believe it's 16, negative 16, then uh, they're, they've been found to have in, uh, increased one to three year mortality. Um, so, in terms of your question, uh, should we do it on every pH patient? Uh, I don't, I don't know that that's practical. Um, but it, when maybe looking at patients who have, you know, either a clinical change in their symptoms or evidence of progressive disease, and they're getting to NYHA three four, um, and they're trying to, and then maybe they're on, uh, you know, first line therapies, and they're trying to decide what is next, then it might be helpful. Um, to inform both the clinician and the patient as to you know what their uh, kind of short-term to short to long-term prognosis is looking like. Yeah, it's probably a worthwhile for our, our group to actually inventory which machines that we have that we can do this. I know we can do this offline using Tom Tech, uh, and but it's actually quite challenging in terms of like you know you have to export the data and then do it offline and so on and so forth, rather than doing it all in one package, like similar to what we can do on the left side. So we have to do a, like with your, with your presentation, I'll, I'll go back and talk to uh, Janice and everyone on. If Janice online can let us know if we can do this uh, uh, in real time. So I think LB, obviously we do this all the time for uh, kind of myopathy, but I'm not sure you actually have the package to do that, <coughs> uh, unless we're doing, uh, using TomTech, which is the offline. So any other questions from our colleagues? Yeah, Chi Ming, uh, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, of course. Yeah, so, so here's the thing. Uh, we, we do it uh, in real time, but the problem is one out of two people, you cannot get the right ventricle free wall. Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't matter how, whichever angle you try. Uh, and then if you can't get a clear image, uh, I don't know whether it's reliable or not. Of course, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like everything else that we do is similar to what we do in um, uh, cardio-oncology when we don't have good uh, uh, wall tracking. Uh, on the left side, we cannot reliably give a, a GLS either. Uh, I mean, similar to right side, you know, uh, with um, the right heart uh, guideline from ASC, obviously, you know, we, we try to do the uh, right heart's focus views and the best that we can do to try to get the free wall um, I mean, in our experience, um, unless it's really technically difficult, in general, we're able to get about 70% uh, give or take uh, to 80% of people with their RV free ward. Obviously, there are patients who are in ICU that we cannot turn, or for some patients that we cannot turn, it will be hard to get those pictures. But, but in general, we can get it in most of the 75-80% uh, of all our patients. So, you know, yes, of course, it's uh, quality dependent. Thanks, Dr. Kumar, for joining us. Any questions? Any any comments on uh, using uh, agitated saving contrast on uh, getting the um, uh, TR jet? Just a, another interesting caveat. So maybe I'll speak to that. So that there's actually an interesting um, a couple of papers that was published uh, many years ago um, to look at uh, uh, how to enhance the uh, uh, the TR jet. Uh, one one of the strategies is actually uh, doing agitated saline contrast, uh, and especially with a little bit of blood uh, that uh, uh, when you draw back, like 0.5 cc uh, out of uh, N 9.5. Uh, CC of saline and uh, agitated with bubbles, and um, you can actually enhance the um, the, the TR jet. So that's uh, um, so you can actually improve it uh, on on the right side. So sometimes we only have like you know very faint signal. So that's some strategy that in case the TR jet is very faint, you can actually enhance it that way. Chiving, if I can if I can add actually the 
The only problem with the actually the ceiling contrast is that because of the large bubbles, you end up getting a lot of artifacts. You get these big broad stripes. Um, <laughs> So, so Chimi can will uh, will contrast you if Which, you use a so, smaller and, amount. Uh, you know, Bernie mentioned the use of uh, ultra enhancing agents. Um, you know, yeah. So oh, if you use definitely contrast, uh, you you can um, definitely get a smoother profile. Um, sorry, that um, the wireless may be uh, be um, be um, not stable, but with with contrast, you, you end up needing a very very small concentration. And if you use the concentration that you use for lepidical opacification, you'll end up with blooming artifacts. So you really need to, to really use a very diluted solution or just wait for the bubble to dissipate after you get your LV pictures until you don't get that blooming of the spectral Doppler signal. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah, those saline contrast study was, was uh, actually conducted before uh, echo contrast was widely used. And uh, but with, with echo contrast, yes, this is another way that we can enhance our TRJ. These are little tricks that can be used. These are great, great tricks that we can use. Good, good points. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Well, with that in mind, maybe we'll just uh, close the meeting and thank you once again uh, for presenting today. And um, I think we haven't talked about this for quite some time, so it's a, it's a good. Um, uh, it's something that we deal with every day, and it's a good uh, opportunity to review this uh, thoroughly. So thank you. Okay, have a good day, everyone. Thank you very so much. Get back five minutes of your day. That was a great talk, Bernie.